Hello, good evening. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Nice. Hello. How's everyone doing? Doing Are great. Are you doing good? It's your good. Hello, hello. Great. Can everyone hear me? Hello, yes. Okay, good, good. Nice that you're all here. Great to be here. Oh, we've got people from all over the place. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. It's always so cool seeing where everyone's from and that people are joining us from all over the world, basically. It's really nice. I don't know. Yeah, rainy Germany. <laughs> Same here. It's not a nice view at my window right now. I hope some of you have a bit more sunshine today. So I see no one in the yeah uh, one in the waiting room, but I think. We can slowly start, right? Um, yeah, from my side. If, if you're ready. <laughs> Good, everyone's ready. Then let's get started, I would say. Um, and of course, hello and welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the Travel Inspiration Talk about Vietnam tonight. And yeah, it's super nice to see you all here. And we're really glad that so many people are joining us for this. Um, so yeah, I am Zaina and I'm from Join My Trip. And I will be one of your hosts for tonight. And of course, I'm not alone. I have a great support from my co-host, Valeska, tonight. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm Valeska, and I'm ready and excited to talk about Vietnam tonight. Yeah, so we host a travel inspiration talk every two weeks around. Um, and our goal is to give you guys some ideas on great destinations around the world that you can travel to once Corona is finally over. So hopefully by, this, by the end of this webinar, you should feel a bit more familiar with some of these specific locations. So like we said, today we're going to talk about Vietnam, a super interesting and versatile country. And I personally have traveled through Vietnam for a few weeks on a backpacking tour, and Sena has been to Vietnam as well. So I guess we both can share some tips today on what not to miss in your trip to this country. Yes, we're super excited to share our stories with you. Um, personally, I have actually visited Vietnam while I was working on a cruise ship. So I guess I know the must sees for tourists and um, Valeska, um, of course, since she was backpacking, um, has some backpacking tips for you, maybe also some more insiders. And yeah, so before we start, let's just find out how many people in our audience have visited Vietnam before. Yeah, so I'm really curious about that too. So let's see. Wow, okay. <laughs> so only very few. Yeah, some of you know the country already, but still, I'm sure we, you, you can all gain some new information from our webinar and get excited to plan your next trip to Vietnam or your first one. Exactly. So a lot of people haven't been to this country. That's great. Um, yeah, so one more thing before we start, um, we want to share some house rules with you. First, we want to keep remind you to keep yourself muted during the webinar. Um, yeah, you have a mute button in the, sometimes it's the bottom row, sometimes it's the top row. Um, yes, and no worries, you can ask your questions at the end of this webinar. To myself and Valeska, we will have a Q&A section here. And if you want to use the chat, then please do so respectfully. Um, yeah, so be nice to everyone. And of course, you can always share your feelings at any time. Uh, just use the reactions button. Also, again, in the bottom row or the top row, wherever you have it, there you will find reactions. Yeah, so why don't we give it a try and see how that reaction thingy works. So are you already excited to learn more about Vietnam? 
Well, I can see one party hat <laughs> and a thumbs up. That's good. Amazing. Um, yes, yeah, so now that we went over some rules, um, first of all, what is Join My Trip, actually? So for the ones that are joining us for the first time today, we just want to give a very short introduction on Join My Trip and who we are and why we're putting on this webinar. So, Valeska, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about Join My Trip? Of course. Well, have you ever been faced with the challenge of wanting to go to a trip, but nobody was wanted to come with you, and so in the end, you decided to not go at all? Well, we realized that a lot of people were facing this challenge, and that's why we created the platform Join My Trip. This platform is a place where we connect trip leaders, so the ones planning and organizing the trips, and their trip mates. So um, they can publish their travel plans on a platform and interested trip mates request to join their adventure. And as a trip leader, you can actually even gain some money out of it. Yes, exactly. Um, so really whatever your budget is and where you want to go, what type of activity you want to do and prefer, there are so many different options and opportunities. Um, so yeah, you get to decide whether you want to be the one organizing or simply just pack your bags and tag along. And currently our community consists of one over 140,000 like-minded travelers and it's still growing. So until this day, we actually represent the world's biggest community of trustworthy travelers. Right, and that's why we're putting together these events so that we can have a place to connect fellow travel lovers and empower you guys to explore together. So if you'd like to know more, feel free to check out our website. We'll post a link in the chat for you guys. And well, okay, Zena, do you want to give our audience an overview about what we'll talk about tonight? Yes, sure. So today, obviously, we're introducing you to Vietnam. And um, like we mentioned in the beginning, it's a super versatile country. So let's see, what can you actually do there? So first of all, we have the history because Vietnam has a very rich and ancient history that dates back 2000 years BC. Um, of course, we know about the Vietnam War, many years of French colonization, but there's really so much more to discover. And especially in the bigger cities, you will find a lot of museums, memorials, and so on to really learn about the history of the country. Um, and then we have the markets and they are in general very popular in Asia. It's just part of the culture, I guess. Um, yeah, but of course, again, in the bigger cities, they got very popular among the tourists as well. And yeah, you will find basically everything from perfectly arranged pyramids of fruits and vegetables to fresh fish and meat, but also clothes, pottery and all kinds of souvenirs. And um, in addition to that, we also have the floating markets, which are super interesting as well. And here the vendors don't have stalls, but actually sell their products from small boats. So which is why they're basically floating and why they're called that way. And um, on these markets, you can usually buy food, but on the touristy ones, of course, they also sell some souvenirs. Then another thing you have to visit is temples. So like Europe has its churches, in the Middle East has mosques, there are temples in Asia. And they're definitely worth visiting. Even if you haven't been to temples in other Asian countries, um, you still have to go to a Vietnamese one because they're really different. In, in one word, I would say incense sticks. So then the next thing is nature. Um, it's a really small country, but there's so many beautiful and breathtaking natural landscapes around. And the nature ranges from white sand beaches, natural caves to mountains and terrace rice fields. Then the next thing is food. Vietnam is very famous for its food. Vietnamese cuisine is very different from the typical Asian food that we usually get in Asian buffet restaurants. Uh, it's also really, really tasty. So talking about food, what are some must try things in Vietnam in your opinion? Uh, so generally, um, Vietnamese food offers a lot of rice. It's one of the main things that they produce and export. So they like it steamed, um, they use it to make sweets, they like wrapping things around it. So pretty much like um, most countries in Southeast Asia, really. But luckily, there's a lot more to the Vietnamese cuisine than rice. So let's begin with a very classic dish, which is the pho. And that's a soup with rice noodles. And sometimes it includes meat and vegetables. And it has a really own and unique taste and aroma that will basically remind anyone of Vietnam instantly when they, when they taste it. Yeah, then another thing is the bi quan. It's a kind of Vietnamese string roll that uses rice paper as a wrap. The filling is a combination of shredded meat, rice, white radish, and carrots. 
Yeah, one more thing that I really liked was Ban Xeo. It's um, kind of a street food because Vietnam offers a lot of street foods. And yeah, this is just one of the options that you have here. It's kind of a pancake, pretty crispy, and you can fill it with prawns, pork, beans, um, and so on. And then you serve it with herbs, you roll it all together, and then you dip it in your sauce. Another street food is the banh mi. It's like a French Vietnamese sandwich consisting of an airy baguette smeared with paved mayo and then topped with vegetable like carrots and cucumbers and several layers of cold cuts. Then another thing you have to try is the Vietnamese beer. So bia hoi is a draft beer and a must-try beverage. People usually sit on small plastic chairs along the pavement and enjoy a few drinks with friends and family. And Vietnam is also one of the biggest beer consumers in Asia. So it's got to be a good one, right? Yes. And another drink um, that you have to try is the Vietnamese coffee. And this is probably one of the most important parts of the Vietnamese culture as well. It's widely known for its very strong and unique taste. But the way that they drip it is almost like a ritual and then mixed with some condensed milk. Tastes very nice. Yeah, okay, but now enough of food because I'm starting to really crave some of these things. So let's move on to some info regarding your infrastructure. Yes, so when it comes to accommodation, you will have a pretty good choice uh, between hostels and hotels with prices starting really as little as two euros per night. Um, or you can, of course, choose a more luxurious stay at around 80 euros per night, really whatever you prefer. But generally, I recommend looking at pictures and reviews of the hotels or hostels so that you don't get surprised in the end. And of course, you can also find a few Airbnbs, but those tend to be available in the more rural areas only. So, for example, in Hanoi, um, you can get Airbnbs from 12 to $50 um, per night. So, yeah, also whatever you prefer. If you're traveling with a lot of people, then that might also make sense for you. Um, so yeah, Valeska, when you were traveling, what kind of accommodation did you choose in Vietnam? Well, I only stayed in hostels because I prefer traveling on a budget. And I usually paid, like you said, only around two to five dollars. And for my rooms, and it was all included with breakfast, so it was really cheap. That's really cheap. I have never paid $2 for a room, but that's amazing. Um, so yeah, let's move on to our transportation. What's your recommendation here? Well, for locals, the main transportations are buses. However, they often take very long. So if you are only staying in the country for a short time, we would recommend taking a flight for longer distances. So like most long distance buses are sleeping buses where you can sleep in case you are a person that is not bothered by surrounding noises like me, for example. So, but if you choose to travel by bus, you should be aware that the quality and standard of transportation is not comparable to European standards. And often the buses are in better moderate to poor conditions. Yeah, and also I noticed that driving in Vietnam is very different from other countries. So it's almost a bit careless and people don't really like to follow the rules. Um, yeah, so if you're open for the adventure and you don't need luxury when driving, um, then the bus will definitely be the cheapest option for you. Yeah, definitely. Agree. One thing you should also be aware of when you get off the bus with the destination, there might be a lot of locals surrounding you and trying to sell you accommodation or a taxi. And this can be quite overwhelming at first. So it is always good to be informed beforehand where you want to stay and how much a taxi should cost at most so you don't get ripped off. Yes, um, and the most popular way in Vietnam to get around with in a city is by motorbike. So locals use it for everything. Sometimes you can really see as many as five people on one motorbike. And yeah, you can also rent your own if you're um, up for that, I guess. But if you want an experienced driver on your side, there's an app called Grab. And it's pretty much like the Asian version of Uber. And you can um, also book a motorbike taxi here. So yeah, now I'm curious, Valeska, have you actually tried that when you were in Vietnam? Have you ever gone on that? Yeah, of course I did. I love driving with a motorcycle bike. So while traveling in, um, it is a way faster way to get around the city in Asian countries. So I love doing that there. Great, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so one other thing that I found really fun um, was to get around by rickshaw. I mean, it's not really suitable for long distances, but it's really a nice joyride or sightseeing within a city. So if you want to try that, that's also really nice. 
Um, yeah, and now that you know a bit more about the infrastructure here, let's get started on how much money we need to prepare. Well, regarding the money, you will feel like a millionaire in Vietnam because like $1 is around 23,000 Vietnamese dong. So you only need 43 euros to be a millionaire, uh, $43, sorry. And on average, you should calculate around 19 to $120 per person per day, including accommodation, transport, excursions, and food. So it really depends on if you're traveling on a budget or more luxurious. I, for example, spend around $30 per day. So yeah, here are just a few examples of prices. Yes, so for example, for an average local meal, um, you should plan around $2. Of course, if you want to go for the more Western type of dinner, then you should yeah, calculate around uh, maybe $8. For beer and coffee, it really just around $1.50. It really depends if you're drinking it at a sidewalk bar or a fancy kind of um, surrounding. And then um, transportation, we said you could rent a motorbike around $9 for that per day, but you can take the public bus, uh, which will only cost you a couple of cents actually. Um, so that's quite cheap. And um, one example for an excursion would also be this, like you can get a 10 hour excursion to the Mekong Delta with boat rides and lunch and so on for just around $15. So really um, kind of check it out beforehand so that you don't pay too much for everything. Yeah, so now that we know what to eat, how to get around and have info about the budget, let's go with a few more general tips. So first of all, you should check if you need a visa. Might sound like common sense, but it happens so often that people forget about this and then it ruins the whole plan. Then always download an offline map. Should be also a no-brainer, but it's one of the things you easily forget. It's super helpful if you don't have any data plans for Vietnam. And also you can download the directions to your accommodation or bus plans, etc. Yes, um, another one would be to buy a local SIM card that can be super helpful. Of course, if you're only staying in the country for a week, then you don't really need it. But um, for example, some people travel through several Asian countries at once. So it's um, really worth it to get a card that also covers all of the different countries so that you don't have to buy a new one each time you leave the country and enter a new one. And this one, yeah, we talked about it before, but again, recommend or research your prices so that you don't get ripped off and you don't pay too much. It really happens a lot, unfortunately. And also on markets, feel free to bargain a bit. It's okay and you should do it, definitely. Yeah, then one personal tip <laughs> for backpackers is to put rain covers on your backpack when you store it in the luggage compartment of public buses because they often store foods down there and for example, like fish and sometimes unfortunately leaks. So um, if you don't want your entire stuff to smell like fish, use the ring cover because you don't want to walk around with a smelling backpack for weeks. Then we mentioned the app Grab before and we really recommend using it to go around for short to medium distances. It's cheap and you don't need to, uh, you need to have cash to pay and you will now, uh, you will know what you have to pay beforehand. Yes, and this last one might sound a bit funny, but really do look twice or maybe even three times before you cross the street because the traffic is just really crazy. And just because uh, someone's traffic light is red and yours is green doesn't mean that they will stop. So watch out. Um, but definitely this is one of the things that I learned in Asia, how to cross these kinds of busy roads. <laughs> yeah, it definitely sounds a bit funny, but I can totally agree on this. And so, as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic is still going on. So let's take a look at the situation in Vietnam at the moment. Well, unfortunately, there's going to be a ban on entry for all foreign travelers, including for transit, with only very limited exceptions. So, for example, for diplomats, highly skilled workers, international students, or foreign family members of Vietnamese nationals. Those who are allowed to enter must undergo a health examination, so the temperature will be measured and they will be tested on COVID. And they must also present a negative COVID-19 test result that they took before the flight. Yes, and then all entrants must quarantine for 21 days in a hotel or a facility specified by the authorities and afterwards quarantine one more week at home. So 
yeah, right now it's really not the, the best time for traveling to Vietnam, but as we all know, these restrictions are subject to change at any time really. Um, so every day there could be, um, yeah, a change on that. So we are going to stay positive and we'll present our trip and ideas to you for this country so that you can start planning for when you're allowed to travel there again. Exactly. Now that you have all the basic information that you need when traveling to Vietnam, we want to introduce you to some specific places you could visit. And so we will share a Vietnam itinerary from north to south from the places we both found worth visiting. Yes, first of all, let's just have a look where uh, Vietnam is located. It's a, yeah, a Southeast Asian country with borders to Cambodia, Laos and China. Um, so yeah, we all know where it's at. Yeah, so as I already mentioned, we will start a trip in Hanoi, North Vietnam, and make our way along the coast to the south. So we will start a trip in Hanoi, one of the most ancient capitals in the world, where travelers can find well-preserved colonial buildings, ancient pagodas, and unique museums within the city center. The city is also known for its cuisine, buzzing nightlife, as well as cultural diversity, and its traffic is always hectic and fast-paced. But even though you'll be happy to know that it's a great place to explore on foot and on every corner, especially in old water, there's something to explore. And the personal tip is the railway street. It's a narrow street in the middle of the city where a train used to drive through every now and then. But unfortunately these trains were banned for safety reasons, but the street is still containing its charm. Yes, from Hanoi, we continue a bit more to the north, uh, to Sapa. It's a town in the mountains of northwestern Vietnam. And yeah, therefore it can also get quite chilly up there. So don't forget your jackets. And the town is famous for its towering peaks, steep but picturesque rice terraces and really cute villages nestled between really breathtaking views of the mountains. And it's Vietnam's, one of Vietnam's most beautiful destinations, but it's not too well known yet. And also some travelers think that it's too far off and they don't have the time to visit. So that's why it's usually not so crowded. And when you travel to the villages, you can see how they used to build the houses, for example, and also pick up some traditional weavings or carvings, which really make great gifts and souvenirs. And yeah, if you want to be a bit more sporty, you can go tracking or hiking there or really just enjoy the nature. And after visiting Sapa, we go back to Hanoi. And from there is really only a short drive to our next destination, which is the Halong Bay. And this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which was also used for many Hollywood movies due to its surrealistic scenery. Um, yeah, so Valeska, what do you recommend to do there? Or, or what did you do when you visited? Um, when I was in Halong Bay, I joined a two days, one night Halong Bay cruise in which we got to discover various islands, beaches, villages, <clears throat> sorry, limestone caves. And um, yeah, it was at a more relaxed pace. So it was really, really nice. And we also got to go kayaking, had a cooking class, and it was a lot of fun with the group on the boat. So yeah, it was absolutely worth it. The only thing I was a little bit disappointed about was that the tour was so full of activities that you couldn't really enjoy being in a beautiful scenery because you have done, <clears throat> sorry, because you have done one activity and just quickly rushed to another. Yeah, so I guess that's a great tip also when you're booking your tours, make sure that it's not too packed, too much to do in little time and that you have to, that you actually have enough time to enjoy everything. Um, and I, rem I remember that these caves were pretty narrow at some points, um, but then again, we had cut, like quite big halls, you could say, and it was super beautiful and very mystical, I guess. Yeah, unfortunately, Halong Bay has gotten quite famous and there are a lot of boats all over, it, which makes it a little bit crowded. So if you prefer it a little more quiet, then you could also visit Ninh Vinh, the Halong Bay on land. Um, it is equally beautiful, but not as popular. So you can rent a bike here for very little money and explore, the ex example, the landscape and the hot springs or the pagodas and statues. Yeah, and a little fun fact here, you can even find a Christian cathedral um, that includes a lot of Vietnamese designs in the building. So I guess it's quite nice to look at. <laughs> yeah, it's super interesting. So um, our next stop is Hue. It is unfortunately a 10 hours bus ride away and it saved me a hotel for tonight since I took a sleeper bus. But like I already said, if you can't sleep, 
everywhere, then it's probably better to take a flight from Hanoi to Da Nang and then go from there. So um, yeah, Huawei is best known for its Imperial Citadel, Royal Mausoleum, and iconic pagodas. The architectural treasures are all located close by the river so that you can rent a private boat for the day and just stop along the way whenever you feel like it. And it's really, really cheap, so no worry about the private boat. Yeah, that's really nice. I like doing that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, then we continue to Da Nang, um, which is pretty much next to it. And this is known as the tourist capital of the South Central Vietnam, basically. And it's most famous for its collection of bridges because they are so creative and iconic. Um, so now that every time the city builds a new bridge, it has to be trendy as well. And here you have the possibility to enjoy the beach or visit the Ling Ong Pagoda that you can see on the pictures. Um, you can also take the cable car up to the Bana Hills, which is pretty much like an amusement park, I guess, um, but with really a lot of attractions like a Wexford Euro Museum, Alpine coasters, but also beautiful gardens uh, to just name a few. And it's also a really nice location in general to watch the sunset because you will have a really nice backdrop of mountains um, to watch, yeah. Yeah, the next step is Hoi An, my absolute favorite place in Vietnam. So Hoi An is a web surf ancient town located in central Vietnam, and it is famous for its many tailors. So if you need dresses to be made for you, Hoi An is your place. And it also has no, is, is also known for its beauty, especially after the nightfalls, when its many colorful lanterns light up to add a special flair to the historical town. Yeah, Zena, I heard that you even made your own lantern. How is that? Yes, I actually did uh, because I was visiting Hoi An with a group of my cruise ship guests. So yeah, you have to really imagine around 30 people sitting in a small craft shop and cutting their fabric and gluing everything together. And then these Vietnamese girls always like, oh, do you need help? Is that okay? And it was really hilarious, uh, but I still have it. It turned out really well, I think. And it's a lot better than just buying one, I think. So if you have the chance, really, you should do it. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely was. Okay, um, so yeah, from here we will continue to Muine. And um, yeah, basically on, on your way to Saigon down, you can stop here. It's a really small fisher village and it's known for the red and white sand dunes. And it's not as well known as Hoi An and therefore less crowded, but has the same kind of chilled vibe. And you can relax at the beach a little or also try kite surfing if you want. And then from here on, we will continue to Ho Chi Minh City or Saigon, as it's also still called. Both names are fine. Um, and this is the business center of Vietnam. And it has a very prominent history going back really hundreds of years. So here you can visit a lot of museums, ornate temples, pagodas, and historical buildings. But then on the other side, you have modern skyscrapers. So it's really a city of contrast and it's very busy. Um, yeah, but you shouldn't miss out the view from one of the rooftop bars, especially during nighttime, because it's really, really nice. Yes, oh, and um, next one is Kanto. And this is a city within the region of the Mekong Delta. So it makes a really great starting point for discovering the maze of waterways and rivers that make up the Delta. And it's also famous for its captivating floating markets and beautiful temples and also very delicious food. Yeah, and then we already got to our last stop. So the last stop we will enjoy in Kandao, which is known for its immense natural beauty with forested hills, deserted sandy beaches, and extensive coral reefs, making it for some excellent diving. So you can just relax there for your last days until you fly home. That's amazing. Really nice. Okay, so yes, uh, like Valeska said, this was our last stop, unfortunately, on the route that we picked out. And we hope that this got you a bit excited to maybe also plan your own trip as a trip leader. Um, if you're not sure how to start here, let's tell everyone about the support that we offer. Yeah, the option is to check out YouTube. We have the recording of our Travel Buddy webinar. We also have another one scheduled tomorrow if you don't, if you have time to come. And yeah, here's the link for the YouTube show. So, and if you want, you can also book a 15 minute slot with our travel experts. 
And they're more than happy to share their knowledge in a one-on-one -on -one session, or at least I am because I'm part of those two. So if you want to chat with me, feel free. So the chat, so I'll post a link in the chat as well. And then we also um, have a great offer at the moment for those of you who want to travel and getting paid at the same time. If you're interested in that, just write us a message to bizstaff at joinmytrip.com and we will provide you with more details. Yes, um, great. So now that Valeska has given you the necessary information to start your trip leader adventure, you also have the opportunity to receive a 40 euro travel budget for the next trip that you publish within the next 20, uh, 72 hours of this webinar. So how can you receive that? Um, simply just publish your trip on our Draw My Trip platform. And once it's published, send an email to our colleague Robin um, with a link of your trip. And you will then receive 40 euros after your first booking of a trip mate is made. So hopefully we will see some of you soon as future trip leaders. And now really quick, before we jump into our question and answer part, I think we need your support. Yes, feedback is really, really important for us because this way we can get an idea of how to keep improving our webinars. So we prepared a short feedback form and you could help us tremendously if you just take one minute to fill it out. We'll post the link in the chat and everyone that fills out the form will receive the slides afterwards. And among all the people who gave feedback, you'll have the chance to win a voucher for $24 off your next booking with we'll my trip. And I think that's a really good deal for minutes. Yes, and if we made you curious, curious about more destinations, uh, we would recommend that you register for our Iceland webinar as well, which is taking place in three weeks. Um, of course, we will also send the link to join this webinar in the chat for those who might be interested. Yeah, in two weeks after Iceland, the next inspiration webinar will take place and it will be a country of your choice. So as you can see, we have five countries for you to pick from and we will start all for 30 seconds. So let's see where we're going next. I'm excited. <laughs> Cuba. Yeah, people want to see everything, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't decide on those. I mean, all the places are so nice. I want to go everywhere. <laughs> yeah, me neither. That's why I'm happy we're giving a choice to other people. <laughs> yeah. But it looks like Cuba we has Cuba. Won. All right. So nice. we're to Cuba. Let's write this down. Great, so Cuba has won, um, that's amazing. So this webinar will then take place in five weeks from now on. So mark that date in your calendar. Um, but of course, until then, you don't have to wait and be curious and impatient because we have some more upcoming events that you can see on this slide right here. Uh, so if you're interested in any of them and if you don't want to miss our Cuba webinar, for example, really check out our events page on our websites and yeah to stay up to date with everything that's going on okay now enough of us talking i think it's time now that the audience can speak yes i agree so since now you've only had the chance to communicate with us per chat um yeah now is your chance really to ask us anything you want to know um you can raise your hand and then one by one we'll answer all your questions and of course we also can go through the chat and answer the questions that you might have asked here we will try our very best. So if you have any questions, just go ahead, raise your hand. All right, Bob, yes, amazing. Um, wait. You have to unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, okay. Now, 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 yeah, now we can hear you, amazing. Oh, I've been to a lot of places in Southeast Asia over the last several years. In Vietnam, I've been to three times. Uh, each time for three weeks. So I know the country very well. I ha of course, I haven't been everywhere. You mentioned Mui Mi. is that how you say it? Mui Mi. That's, I never even heard of it. I can't believe <laughs> it. Um, but uh, I did say in the beginning of the chat that uh, I wasn't sure if this is more for beginners because I'd been there a lot. And I was, somebody said, well, maybe you can offer your advice. So I'm just here if anybody wants I know some of you guys have been there too. The only thing I will suggest right off the bat, bat as far as the SIM card, 
is to get it in the airport because if you want to use a grab to get to your homestay or hotel, you're going to need to have uh, a SIM card to be able to uh, download the app and register and all that. And if the driver needs to contact you, maybe they can't find you or whatever, they're, and you're waiting outside, they need to communicate with you. And my first two trips, I lucked out. There's a, um, if it's still there, there's a SIM card seller. They're all in one row in one place and the departures right before the exit to the left. This is the very last one to the left. It's a direct seller. It's not an agent. And it was the cheapest and the best. It was basically about seven or eight dollars. And it lasted me for three weeks. So nice. I had good service everywhere. Um, of course, you use Wi-Fi whenever you can to lower. Oh, oh. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can still hear you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so use Wi-Fi whenever possible so you don't use up your data. But the third year I went, I arrived after 10 p.m. That seller was closed. They were all two to three times the price, four times the price. I had to buy one that cost three times the price. They said this, this uh, uh, carrier was the best. I had problems with it. So I would still, I wish I knew the name of that carrier, but if it's still there, it's all the way to the left, all, the very last one. And it's like um, 150 or so. It was then uh, Vietnamese, Vietnamese Don, which is about seven US dollars for the SIM. And you make sure they know it's working. You, they test it on your phone before you leave the booth. That's really great. That's a good piece of advice right here. I can only agree with that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And the food is unbelievable. So anybody, I don't want to keep talking, but if anybody has questions or if you want to explain anything, I'll be happy to. Did you have a favorite food that you remember? Yes, Cao Lao. What is In that? Hoi An. Um, it is a, it's a thick noodle. I was told it is similar to uh, a Japanese noodle called udon. It's made from the water in a, that's from a family's well in Hoi An. So you can't get it anywhere else. And it's an unbelievable, it's not a soup. It has like a gravy or broth at the bottom. You mix it as sliced pork and they bring you a huge plate of all kinds of herbs. That's what I love about street food there. They bring you all these herbs and you mix them. And first you like take a little taste of each just to see if you like it before you, know, before you add it. And then you mix everything up. And that cost me like around a dollar uh, there in Hoi An. Uh, I just loved it so much. I had it two or three more times when I was there. And then I said, before I went back the second time, I would love to be able to learn how to cook it myself. So I signed up for all these expat groups on Facebook, which is a great idea to do because you can ask these people, these are English speaking people who live there now. And also even locals are there. You can ask them all kinds of questions and advice. So I posted, Cao Lao is my favorite dish. This is on the Hoi An Expats page. Can anyone teach me how to make this? I'm, I'm coming on such and such date. I had several people offer. I took up this one lady's offer. She, she said it's her favorite dish too. And when I asked her how much it would cost for me to learn, she said, oh, no, no, no cost. She was just doing it as a friend. And that's what I find about the Vietnamese people. They are so kind and they're so real. Um, and so uh, we, she picked me up in the morning. I met her at the Big Hoi An Central Market, which is an open wet market where they sell all kinds of things. And there's also street food people in there. And we picked out all the, the noodles, the fresh noodles. We picked out the pork, all the herbs. I got on the back of her motorbike. And we rode to her home in the rural area of Hoi An. And she taught me how to cook everything. Now, these are the kind of experiences I love. I don't like to do tourist things. I mean, I do think you should do a street food tour the first day in any new city because it allows you to see the layout of the city and to get to know what food you like and don't like. It's a good start to a new city. Yeah, that I agree. But that sounds so amazing. Like meeting friendly and, and people that are like super nice and just share everything with you. That's amazing. It's really nice. So many kind of experience, people who have been so kind in Vietnam, it's unbelievable. That's, that's why I love the country. Yeah, true. that's true. That's what I perceived as well. That's why what? That's what I saw as well. Like when I was talking to people, they all just wanted to share everything with you. And 
it was really lovely. I think they like to practice their English too. <laughs> that too, yeah. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Definitely. My second visit, I asked my hotel, where can I go where there's not many tourists? You said District 3. Took a grab there. I didn't see one tourist. Walking around, had some street food. Had, um, I think it was my first time having Kam Tam. And then I saw the street food. It wasn't really a street food restaurant, but it was open. It, it was like open air, but it was a sit down place. And um, I asked the lady who worked there, you know, if I could see a menu while I'm looking, these three Vietnamese people were sitting at a table right in the front, a Vietnamese lady and two guys. And the one lady passes me an empty mug. This is a customer who's eating there, passes me an empty mug and pours me a beer to share it with them. They didn't even speak any English. That's right? crazy. Isn't that really cool? So welcoming. That's amazing. Yeah. And then um, uh, I was asking about things on the menu. And one of them I asked about to the waitress, the, what the lady said, she pointed, they had, that was one of the dishes and she offered it to me to try it before I ordered it. That's what I mean. It's unbelievable. The experience. That's so cool. Amazing. Great. Um, I don't want to interrupt you, but of course you can uh, also, if you have the answer to any of these questions, I just want to get to the questions that were asked in the chat a bit. So the first one that reached me was, um, what are your thoughts on traveling Vietnam with young kids that are aged five and three? And I would say, I personally probably wouldn't take kids because it's a really busy country, but I guess it also depends on where you're going. If you're going to like these really busy um, big cities, then for me personally, I don't think it's too great but then again some else might um, have a different opinion what do you think Valeska? Yeah I'd say the same thing um, especially like those smaller rural areas it would be amazing for kids as well um, especially that like, you can do a lot of things outside and a lot of interesting new things I think um, but the biggest cities are just too overwhelming I would say and too busy but yes. you've got to decide for yourself, I guess. Especially because motorbikes can come up on the sidewalks when you're walking. And if you're not keeping your eye on the kids every second, that could be dangerous. Yeah, exactly. And the holes, the big holes in the sidewalks and stuff too, if you're not watching where you're walking. Yeah. Okay, then another question was, uh, do you have info for hiring a translator and a car service or info for private tours? Uh, I think Sena did all the chores with her cruise ship, so she probably doesn't have any. And I didn't do that much tours, and I didn't book, I didn't hire a translator or car service or anything. I was just taking a bus and went from there. But I realized I think... that every every hostel I went to, they had like ten thousand options on where you could go and which tour you could make. So um, I'm sure you will find something. Yeah, and I think also, of course, you can book a lot of tours before on these, you know, TripAdvisor, Get Your Guide, whatever. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that whenever you book them there locally, you will get them for a lot cheaper than when you book them in advance through one of these big platforms, I would say. So it probably also makes sense to just go to like a tourist office or something like that. Um, yeah, and really just uh, compare prices again that's oh, i think or hotel concierge oh yeah yeah of course um your reception even if you're staying in a hostel they always know a lot of good places to go yeah definitely um one other question was what time of the year is best to uh, visit vietnam i was there in well, our winter months, so that was like November, December, January um, type around. And it was, I think it was really nice. I think we didn't have, yeah, we did have rain um, a couple of times, but generally I think it's not as hot as in the summer months. So I would prefer that. When did you visit? I visited in June. So um, it was monsoon season, but I really don't mind because I think it's less busy in the zoom season and it's not that hot because sometimes it still rains and I mean 
monsoon in Asian countries is like, okay, it rains for an hour and then it's done, kind of. So it didn't really bother me that much. Yeah, just bring your rain jacket. <laughs> yeah, there's no bad weather, only bad clothing. <laughs> I hate the sentence, but it's so true. <laughs> yeah, um, that's true. I, 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 I don't take hot weather well, so I've always traveled in January and February because uh, it's the driest of, of it's, as far as the humidity. Like when I was there in February uh, two years ago, it was like 94, 96 during the day in Saigon, but it was only 40 something percent humidity. So it was hot, but much better than if it was very humid because I was in Indonesia in September 2019. It was only in the high 80s. It was 100 percent humidity. You talk about hot. It was hot. What I've done is like Hanoi, people think, you know, Vietnam is a hot country, but Hanoi actually is cool in January and February. So what I do is I start in the south in, let's say, late January or so or mid-January, and then work my way north. So by the time I get to Hanoi, it's not as cool as it would be if I started my trip there on the same date. So you might, if you want to go to a different, lot of places and you want to, for the weather to be the best, you might want to look at weather.com or something and see what historical weathers are and plan your itinerary based upon being there at the best time for when you're going to be there. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds really good. Okay, then we skipped one question in between. It was how safe is water or eating uncooked vegetables, herbs, foods, etc.? Well, personally, I never had any issues with it, but um, I'm not the type of person that gets a messed up stomach easily. So I don't know if you have anything else. Well, I I mean, water, I didn't didn't drink it from there. So no, I, I wouldn't drink tap water. water but I wouldn't drink tap water in Spain either. So that's, I mean, just buy <laughs> bottled water, I guess, but then you should be fine. Yeah, um, but I never had any problems with uh, the food. So the only thing that was difficult, I was, I met a girl from South Africa there and she was allergic to seafood and they put fish sauce over everything. So that's yeah. the only thing that was kind of challenging. Because like every time she said, please, no fish, no fish sauce, they were still putting it in. So, yeah, yeah she okay. had a little bit of a problem, but everything else should be fine. So, yeah, that's a bit, um, <laughs> a bit complicated. Then I remember <laughs> that they had fish sauce for everything. Um, so another question here is, is it safe to travel around Vietnam? And in my opinion, yes, definitely. I mean, like in every big city, unfortunately, you have to deal with pickpockets. It's just a thing that, yeah, you have to be aware of. That can happen to you anywhere if you're in Barcelona or in Rome or in New York or in Vietnam, in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, so just take care of your stuff. Um, don't leave it somewhere. But then again, like I never felt, I think the, the most or the unsafest that I felt was when crossing a street in the beginning, but then you get used to that as well, so. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, I never felt unsafe. I mean, and I was traveling solo. I mean, I always met people and I never felt alone. That's how it is when you're traveling, but um, still I never felt unsafe and it was just an amazing adventure. So I loved every minute of it. Amazing, really nice. Okay. Um, so did I miss anything? I think you missed the question with the wheelchair. I think someone is having concerns about that. So oh, here. Um, yes. So I have concerns for members of my some that need a wheelchair. Okay. Um I'm not sure if you can rent wheelchairs somewhere over there, but generally, if you have one, I would always say to take your own because you never know if you can rent one or, yeah, uh, get one somewhere. Um, I think the only thing that could be a bit complicated is really to get around if you want, like, you couldn't be able to, to take the motorbikes, for example, to get around. But in buses, if you can walk the stairs and everything to get in, it didn't into the bus or out of the bus. Um, I mean, yeah, you have to kind of work your way around. Some things might not be possible with a wheelchair, but uh, generally, 
Yeah, it, it might be difficult, especially like we always said that the streets are kind of bumpy sometimes. So I don't know if you can really assess it with a wheelchair. And also cities are really crowded and a motorcycle or driving them sideways sometimes. So I'm not sure if it's too good to be. I mean, you can always try to work your way around it, sure, but it will be challenging. Yeah, I think you have to, from the beginning, just uh, really start to plan your itinerary according to it. And research, I guess there's uh, probably um, a lot of forums or things about Vietnam especially. So maybe some locals that can help you out with some tips and tricks that they know of, things like that. Yeah, like one example would be like to work your way around it. It would be like to rent a rickshaw for the day and then you can see the streets from there, go around the places and then it would be easier to get around. So that would be a suggestion for me. Yeah, or maybe in that case also really then to go and book beforehand because then you can really have a look at wheelchair accessible tours that you can do or rent like a private private car or something like that um, where you can really then, you know, take care of everything yourself but do they have trains at all yes they do yes. i never used one but yes they do <laughs> they do it's not um super great and they don't have like too many railways i think a lot of them got destroyed and haven't been replaced yet but i guess they're working on it but yeah buses are the better option to get around because they have a lot better connections yeah and it's super easy by bus like I got there and there's like one tourist bus option I don't remember how it was called I'm really sorry I would love to share it with you guys um and I could just book it and say like okay I want five stops and then you can just go out of the bus whenever you feel like it and get back in so I used that to get all the way from Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh so yeah that was a really good option but you can just go to the internet and search for trips from Hanoi to wherever you want to go and there are going to be like 10,000 options so yeah it's really easy to take the bus. I do know something about the trains because I investigated them. Going north to south there's there's a fair amount of trains. The issue is if you're going to do a sleeper overnight which because they're long trips if you're going north to south um you know, people say you just can't sleep on the train. So you're not going to get a good night's sleep. You're going to be tired. And I read that even in first class, the bathrooms, because they're shared, they get kind of dirty if, you know, as the trip starts going. And you might, I, I couldn't do it from what was explained to me. I wouldn't, wouldn't want to be using those bathrooms. So I think I'd only take a, tr a train if it could be for me, if it could be a day, you know, a day trip. Okay. Yeah. Do they have like these standing toilets or <laughs> how is it? Yeah. <laughs> and also there's like, you know, urine all over the floor. And so I said, oh. no, no way. I said, there's no way I'm going to be wanting to step in that. I said, forget it. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't sound so good. <laughs> I can totally agree. <laughs> right. right. I feel sorry, so sorry for the people who don't investigate and do it and find out that is their, that is what's there, you know? <laughs> Anyway, well, then you have to live with it if you're on the train and you have to follow through. Exactly. It's <laughs> to talk about. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, also, you did mention Hoi An. I love Hoi An. It's really pretty. People were saying, oh, it's so touristy. You know, you read messages on TripAdvisor. But, you know, it's, it's all according to what you enjoy. It's touristy, meaning it's set up for tourists. There's a lot of shops and stuff. But it is beautiful. There's no McDonald's. There's no Starbucks. So it's not like what we think as being very touristy, where it's all commercialized. Yeah, there are stores, but they're authentic. You know, they're 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 not they're not the chains. And when I was in Shanghai, I went to these. I think they're called Tongs, the old houses that were converted that people used to live in the 17th and 18th centuries. And what did they have on the bottom floor? Starbucks and McDonald's and all that. I was so turned off. Yeah, I don't really understand these tourists. First step, step out of the airport is like, okay, where's the next McDonald's? 
I mean, my, my, my thinking is what's the point of going to these countries and if you're not there to experiencing things you can't get here, you know? <clears throat> so I get it. I, I, I try, I won't say I try anything once because, you know, they eat, in some of these countries, they eat bugs. And by the way, in, in the food in Vietnam, especially in the soups like the pho, I don't know if you know, they use pig's blood. Mm-hmm. I heard. And so <laughs> I, for anyone here who is thinking of going, if they're like, sky's the limit, I'll eat anything, cool. But if you would like to know in advance, I read up and I made a list of the things I didn't want to eat, like organ meats, blood, um, what else? Uh, anything that's very hot and spicy, I can't eat. And I had my hotel translate into Vietnamese. And so when I went to have street food or whatever, I showed them the list. So, you know. That yeah, that's was- how that's if African, African lady did it as well. Like she let someone write it down for her. Like, I can't eat fish sauce. Please don't put it in. And yeah, yeah, it still sometimes happens. And so her sister was always the one trying it. It was like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> you can eat it. Or uh, probably not. <laughs> It's so funny. I have a friend in Vietnam who loves to cook and he just turned me on to fish sauce. I just bought it recently on Amazon, actually. And um, I'm starting to experiment, you know, what things to add it to. And I had it with salmon. I didn't like it. It made the salmon taste very fishy. But in other dishes, it's like an enhancer. It enhances the flavor. Yeah, I love it too. Like, I didn't even realize it was in everything before I met her, so. <laughs> yeah, Are there any other questions also from anyone else? We got the questions about more details about Kanto. Um, yeah, Kanto is really, I think it's the fourth biggest city in Vietnam. So it's, it's pretty city-like, but close to nature due to the Mekong Delta. Um, I don't know if you have any more details about it. I do. I've, I've been there twice. Okay. <laughs> I, I was surprised. You know, I had Mekong Delta. I thought, oh, farmland, you know, but but Kanto is the city. It's not like Saigon at all. Yes, it is a city, but it's more open. It's not as hectic. Hectic maybe compared to some of our cities because of the boulder bikes and all that, but it's it's nothing like, like Saigon. Um, and what I booked was, and this is my em- impetus for going there the first time, uh, there was a street food tour offered for free. Um, you just had, they suggested the five, this is in 2017, a $5 tip per person to the guide. And you shared the cost of all the food. You went to like five, six different places and you shared the cost. So if there were, in ours, there were four people total. So whatever the bill was, it was split by four. And it was very cheap. It was like $2 and change each and each you know, restaurant. And so it was great because we got to try so, you know, three, four, five things at each place. So we got like 20, 30 different things, but highly recommend that. And then uh, the next morning I had to get up like a 4 a.m. to make a 5 a.m. Uh, boat tour to see the floating markets. That was what I always had dreamed of seeing floating markets. Um, but they're starting to die there because they use the boats to transport the produce. And as they're building more and more bridges in Vietnam, they don't have as much of a need to use the boats. So uh, they're less and less, but they were there. I, I still recommend it to do it as a, you know, as a one-time thing, because at the end, you're like going through these small canals and it's like you're in the middle of a jungle. You know, it's kind of cool. You're navigating on a narrow boat. And then we get off and we have lunch somewhere, you know, in the rural area. Uh, so I, rec- I really recommend the experience. Um, the next year, because I, I kept in touch with the um, with the guy, the guy, the food guy, and nobody was registered for the tour. He says, keep checking closer and closer, and there was nobody. So we just did it, the two of us. The problem was, after two restaurants, we were full because there weren't all these other people to share the food with. So I didn't get to try as many new things. So that was that was a negative, but you know, whatever. It's, I still like I can't. Uh, I stayed there for a little bit longer this time to experience the food. And what I found amazing, I saw all in the street food, but there's all these fruits I have never seen in my life before. I never even expected that. That was not one thing I expected when going to Vietnam. 
I said, I can't, I mean, I'm talking about 20, 30, 40, 50 different fruits. I'd never even seen pictures of it. I didn't know what they were. So my guy from the boat tour took me and he, we bought one piece each. He told the seller, uh, cause normally they sell by kilo. We're only going to buy one of each. We're going to buy a lot of different things. And that's what we did. And after that, I asked him what I owed him for that because he went above and beyond after the motorboat tour. He said, what do you mean? I goes, oh, I was giving him money. I didn't ask him how much. He said, what's this for? I said, it's a tip. Oh, no, no, I don't want anything. You pay for the tour. He wouldn't take it. So cute. <laughs> they're, they're so nice. As I said, people are nice. But I definitely recommend Kenta do the floating market tour, do a street food tour the night before and maybe even stay an extra day to experience the food there. It is different than the rest of Vietnam. Yeah. Amazing. I took a bus. The bus was only like five dollars <laughs> from Saigon. It's a sleeper bus. It's, I, I, it always amazes me, like every time someone talks about it, how cheap compared to what we are used to, it actually Not is. Unbelievable. It's, it's like a sleeper bus. It doesn't, the beds don't adjust, but like you lay back, it's like bunk beds. There's like two levels there, I think. Um, and you do a rest stop, at least one or two rest stops. They give you slippers because you have to take off your shoes, put them in a plastic bag. And uh, they give you water, bottled water and a snack. Um, it, it does take about six hours or more from your hotel because first you got to get to the bus station. And then I, I was confused at first. It's not the bus that takes you to Kanta. It's a feeder bus. It takes you to the main bus station, which is outside the city of Saigon and then you have to wait for that bus to take off and then you get on a you go to the big station in Kanta and then you have to wait for these vans that take you right to your hotel so all in all it's about six hours door to door but if you plan for that and bring something to read and you can rest you know it's air conditioned it's fine but air conditioned is a big thing <laughs> exactly now on my second trip I think I was coming from Thailand and I found that I could fly from Thailand right to Kanta that they had an airport there. I didn't know that the first time. So I was able to skip the bus that time because uh, it was very cheap. I think on Air Asia, it was like eight or nine dollars to fly by jet from, from Kanta to Saigon. And it was only an hour. So uh, it's much quicker and almost the same price as the bus. It was unbelievable. <laughs> Crazy, really crazy. Um, amazing. So I think, yeah, we have all learned a lot. Even Valeska and I have also been to the country. We have learned some new things from Bob. Thank, thank you so yeah. much. It's uh, really interesting. So if you ever want to share something from your travels, again, let us know. And <laughs> Amazing, great. It was really interesting, everything you said. So thank you so much. Okay. Cool. Good. So thank you everyone for joining and have a lovely evening and yeah. we'll see you in the next you as well. Bye -bye. travel content meeting. <laughs>